Hey guys, welcome back to part three of my chat with neurologist and content creator Siddharth Warrior. Here we unpack how food and our mind really work together, how even fasting can really affect it, and so much more. But before we head into my chat with Sid Warrior, I wanted to smash that bell icon and hit subscribe. Go straight in to my chat with Sid Warrior on Take a Pause with Me, Varun Dugirala. I actually want to ask you this because I I read that you are trying to change your relationship with food where you're saying okay when I'm only going to you 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 you're trying out fasting and you're trying to say I can't detach from um what what is your relationship with food right now what's going on very very recent story this I have always been hmm. uh, I've always enjoyed eating uh, I it it would yeah. it, I I I I feel that I would even if I'm alone I would take effort to make sure that uh, I have things in front of me that I like. I arrange my uh, room if I'm reading a book or if I'm watching something. I want to make sure that everything is set, and I, I enjoy that process. Um, but in the last few months, I have been reading more and more about metabolic health, and uh, how even it's not really our fault, but the way that the market is structured now, we are basically consuming a lot more than we need to. so even if you try you cannot burn it off it's it's very difficult to burn off everything that you are consuming on an average day and especially since i have a sedentary lifestyle except for the time where i'm working out or swimming because uh, you know as a as a doctor mm. i'm sitting as a content creator i'm sitting there's not much of yeah. uh, field work not not a lot of that i have a car i would drive around i i realized that uh, I do need to change my relationship with food. It's not that I don't enjoy it anymore, but I am hmm. closer than ever before to feeling that fasting should be a part of our lives. Um, hmm. And so I, I recently did a video for Ultra Human, um, and I, I have to do one hmm. more. So this video is going to be entirely on intermittent fasting. Uh, just just to get used to the idea that fasting is not a threat. and once i you wearing the glucose monitor uh, you you have yeah, the patch yeah, yeah. on your arm like i've seen so many people around yeah. me yeah these days yeah. so the patch is there it's just a, i mean that itself is just an excuse but even after the mm. experiment is over it is something that i would like to continue also because all the evidence points towards it uh, even even our traditional value systems all traditional value systems in fact uh, talk about fasting so mm. I, i think it is something that i would like to incorporate into my life that is presently not there i have seen a bunch of schools of thought on this one um i don't subscribe to to i think any said i've chosen to be non committal is i've said to people i know who are constantly work doing like you know long term intermittent fasting you know they they're fasting for a long period of time only eating meals in batches i've been doing that now for many of them doing now for a couple of years now. um there's another set who have also taken that to an extreme where they've gone like 36 hours wow. 48 hours even longer sometimes and then eating after that uh, which i i find to be extreme in that sense now one is to kind of do that and i understand what fasting does but um i'd want to know because now you're studying how this affects us as well as you understand how the mind is um while i'll come to the other part i want to first ask you how does doing this uh, how does it work between our brain and our uh and our body um, because in in a sense you are telling yourself i might be hungry but i'm not going to hmm. eat right uh, there is both short term and long term effects uh, in the extreme short term i think it would be quite discomforting like for example uh, today i've had breakfast and uh, i've i'm having a cup of coffee right now and i will just directly have dinner uh, after this um, this is part of part of something that i'm trying out because i'm otherwise healthy i feel that i can take this i i have reserve enough that i can experiment now with my own body with my own mm. food habits definitely would not recommend somebody who already has diabetes or something to try out something you should mm. talk to your doctor and do this uh but in the long term what happens is that extra fat in your body releases something called as leptin 
and leptin is what is supposed to regulate your brain's decision making regarding food and mm. your brain develops something called leptin resistance which essentially means that even if there is leptin in your body your brain cannot really process it and so you will still feel hungry you will still eat so at some point you have to ask yourself mm. that wait so if i am still hungry is it that i am actually hungry is it that my body needs it or is it that my brain doesn't know that my body has enough food and is still telling me yeah. so is it a communication problem and that is a difficult decision to make you know so chances chances are yeah. that just like insulin resistance uh, more and more people are on that spectrum of leptin resistance definitely something that we should as a society think about because it it forms the underlying principle of how obesity is connected to depression and how diabetes is connected to depression because all these things are you know part of one spectrum it's interesting that you, when you say that right is that the tendency for someone who is already unhealthy because of an unhealthy eating lifestyle to eat unhealthier is very high yeah. versus someone who actually eats healthy um i think in in a sense does continue to eat healthy now um, and it might not have as much of a so i i found the other spectrum of like people who don't put on weight that easily um so for me it's a constant thing to tell myself i am hungry like i'll forget to have lunch just by instinct and i will suddenly at like 4 pm be like okay why am i kind of feeling a little off and, oh i forgot to have lunch the number of times i will i've had a day when i will be say like, okay i forgot to have lunch um is very high so i'm the other spectrum i feel i don't know if that's the way to put it where you've naturally never had the need to eat till your body's gone extreme and say dude hello wake up you forgot um so i fall into that side of things what's very funny for me is uh, i mean uh, it's also interesting that people who are underweight and who are trying to mm. bulk up say that they have a tougher job than people who are trying to lose weight and the and the yeah. argument uh, between these two camps is uh, it's so heartfelt you know both pe- both ends of the spectrum are struggling i have been told by people saying that why do you just what do you mean you have trouble lose, uh, putting on weight it's a good thing i'm like no it's not i have tried my entire life i finally come to the point where i understand how to make it happen and keep it stable uh, because i went the extreme of like really putting on more weight and getting bulkier and i realized how much that tired me out and it just generally made me more lethargic and everything else i went swung back to just focusing on being fit but in many ways for me it was that eternal struggle of something like do one thing i come go nikal ke mujhe de do na i make it nikal ke de deta tumko so i i've been through uh, been through many of those conversations in life uh and continuing on the food uh, food topic the other and i have always wondered and see i have always been the person who will buy the apple watch to track whenever there's a new thing there um we'll get we'll want to get the newest thing to find the newest data for some reason with glucose monitors i have told myself in my head that maybe i don't want to look at that data right and i just want to focus on how i'm feeling about it uh, am i feeling hungry am i not feeling hungry do i need to eat now or not eat now um i'm trying to do it the old school way if, if that's the way to call it because i have enough people around me who are now got the monitors and they're checking and so oh, this is how the last meal affected me this is when i should shift it around i have a feeling I, i will eventually succumb to fomo and get it but yeah. i'm trying to understand that is this constant focus of tracking um how we're functioning as human beings um and looking at these metrics because we look at metrics on everything right content look at metrics you look at metrics on um do you feel at some point um will that also be something that will be a negative yeah. for us i th- i think it will uh i would definitely not recommend that unless somebody is uh, a diabetic with hypoglycemic uh, episodes at night or uh, maybe an athlete who's on a very strict diet and a very new diet i think glucose mm-hmm. monitoring should be a transient thing maybe you do it once in your life or maybe once in 2 years just to see how your body is reacting to carbohydrate intake that's mm-hmm. it other than that uh, the, the reason that we look at instagram metrics is because there is no natural way for us to know how the reel is doing mm-hmm. but that is not true with glucose that's not true with heart rate 
That's true. Right. So there are inbuilt yeah. feedback mechanisms. It's just that we have now become blind to it. We are not sensitive enough to it. Uh, so this is just a way to increase that sensitivity, to increase that awareness. But then after that, I think we should just let our own biological feedback take over. I think I'm also not doing it because I don't want uh, some uh, an app to tell me what I already know, which is that I should not have had those two cookies at 9 p.m. last <laughs> night. Um, and um, so at some point, I'm, I'm staying away from that information hitting me in the face because I already knew about it enough. Yeah. Um, I want to tap into a few more things because, I mean, the more we're talking, I'm kind of thinking about because we're surrounded with so much information about neuroscience now on the internet, what is the weirdest thing that you have seen that people claim this is how our mind works, which you, which you innately know is not true. What have you seen people propagating, which is definitely not like, this is not fact. Please stop sharing wow. this. Um, so funnily enough, too uh, many. funnily enough, not so much of neuroscience stuff. Uh, although I, I do find mm. those memes of uh, serotonin, oxytocin, dopamine, um, Mm. A little too oversimplified. Mm. But then again, mm. the way I feel it is that it's good that at least uh, the awareness of those terms are spreading. Right? Uh, because if you if people don't even know what... And no one can understand all of it at once. No one can share mm. all of it at once. So it's... Um, I think it's okay. Uh, I would... I would I think it's fine to err on the side of uh, oversimplification for the sake of mm. spreading awareness. Because mm. once somebody learns that, okay, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin are neurochemicals, then later on they may go mm. into a little bit depth and find out how they're all connected to each other. But if they don't even know the terms, then no further discussion can happen. Mm. I think what is far more yeah. uh, dangerous is when people talk about the psychology of certain uh, mental health problems and uh, mm. oversimplify it in terms of uh, you can have depression because your partner is uh, your partner is talking to you in a particular way a study shows that uh, so mm. that the, the danger there is that people can take that home and make actual life consequences yeah. and which is uh, not something that should happen this is what my father calls uh, Dr. Google. Um, he says that uh, when, whenever I turn back with my own diagnosis of what I'm going through, he's like, have you gone to Dr. Google? Is this why you're giving me your own diagnosis of how things are going? Right. Um, I'm like, sorry, I've done that. And he's like, stop doing, stop diagnosing yourself. You're not a doctor. Um, I feel it's also that, right? We, we, I think for every small, everything, we try to find a solution without having to go to an expert, especially when we should. I, for the longest time, claimed to the world I had ADHD. Because I've always had an attention problem. So, you know, you we've all joked that, oh, Parun's got ADHD. I've claimed I have ADHD. Then one day I said, okay, I want to actually figure out if I do. So I went to a therapist. And, and she, I think within 15 minutes, said, you're not even close to having ADHD. You have autonomy. I'm like, what's that? Now I'm interested. I want to know more. Um, and then she got deep into the fact that my issue is not the attention, but my issue is that if someone tells me how to go from, I can go from point A to point B if, if someone tells me to. But if someone tells me how to go from point A to point B, my mind is like, dude, no, I will figure my way through. Right. Um, and I was like, okay, that makes sense. So, so I feel the problem is also that it's like we associate ourselves and then we research what that means. And then we go deep down that rabbit hole and we take those symptoms. We assume we have them. Our mind has thought of what it's saying. Boss, you you have all these symptoms. You might not have had them before you read it. Um, so that's been my learning about just like Googling stuff and finding those facts and going down that rabbit hole. Because you can go very wrong with your own diagnosis. Let's and be this honest. This happens in psychology, especially. There is a chapter on defense mechanisms in the medical textbook. And uh, the, the mm. day that defense mechanisms are taught, that night in the hostel, every single medical student goes to sleep thinking that they have around 14 to 15 defense mechanisms activated. And out of that, four or five are abnormal ones. So they all go to sleep thinking that they are psychiatry patients. And it takes some time before you realize that, you know, everything is a spectrum. And it's because only the pathological terms are available to us that availability bias kicks in. 
Mm. We are not talked. We are not told yeah. about what does ADHD look like in the normal side of things. Similarly yeah. for OCD, similarly for depression, similarly yeah. for anxiety. Every mental health problem is on the spectrum of normalcy. And just because you're feeling sad doesn't mean that you're depressed. Just because you're feeling anxious doesn't mean you have anxiety disorder. But since everybody is talking about anxiety disorder, somebody who's anxious might self-diagnose and say that, you know what, I have anxiety disorder. And then fit in all the other definitions to himself or herself. I started off this conversation by saying that there's so much information out there on the internet, but I feel in some ways, there are things, my larger inference, there are things that we should know about how our mind works and how our, you know, how our body and our mind connect together and how that flows. But um, when you go beyond a level, go to an expert, don't come up with the theory yourself. Um, or you'll just end up with theories which make no sense to when you like, when you, you might have gone down that rabbit hole so much. It can be um, paralyzing. No? And yeah, it's, it's paralyzing. And, and more than anything else, I feel that most of us now genuinely also want to learn more. Like I would gladly today, I was I was talking to um, someone who was a doctor. I'm like, today he asked me, what would he want to go study? I'd love to study psychology. Like it would innately be what I would want to study. I didn't know what I wanted to study when I was in my 10th standard. I'm like, today, run and do like a psychology degree. And I'm a person who's always said education is overrated because I never enjoyed education. Um, is there something you would go and study today if you had a chance? Yeah, so psychology would definitely be one uh, because I feel that I'm already circling around it so much from the neuroscience perspective that I would love to learn officially uh, what uh, current 2022 modern day psychology is talking about. And it is on the books. Uh, I, I am planning to do that sometime. It's, it's, uh, it's my plan for between 2023 and 2024, I want to get another degree, which I promise myself I will not do. Because at one point it was like a, <laughs> it was like an addiction. I had my friends making fun of me. Ki, Achha, aur ek, aur ek, bas ho gaya. Uh, but one more. This is the last one, I swear. I might just go and do it. I, I, I so I, I have um, I don't have as many. I, I, I spent too much time studying engineering. I spent six years finishing <laughs> a four-year degree. So I've oh, oh, I've overqualified as an engineer. Um and then did mass com. But I think today if I had to go, um I meant I remember recently and I was so intrigued saying um, I met a, I think a 19 year old who said he wants to go study a combination of economics and psychology and I'm like that kid's been taught well in school uh, I would have never thought about that combination when I was in sure. uh, his age People have, uh, so what is very interesting to me now is the concept of dual degrees so I love that mm. uh, I truly believe that uh, the future is going to be ruled by people on intersections you you might have a combination of the two weirdest life skills ever. But if you stick to them, you'll find that you are in a niche field. And for someone who actually operates at intersection, which is you, between being on the medical side and being content creator, um, thank you so much, Sid, for coming on the show. It's been it's been fabulous. Um, as always, I've stuck to my clock, which is what I constantly look at. Um, and, but um, I'm pretty sure with this is only, only one of the many conversations we'll end up having on recorded unrecorded on this topic because there's so much to unpack um but i think this has been a good start to talking about how our mind works and and everything else lovely thank you so much for having me Varun. always a pleasure talking to you thanks thanks for coming on take a pause Bye. i hope you enjoyed this entire conversation with that warrior stunts to unpack there about your mind and how it works and if you haven't caught part one and part two make sure you do as well as if you want to listen to it in this audio form can catch it on your favorite streaming app. So till the next chat, the next video, make sure you hit subscribe and smash that bell icon because a lot more content coming your way. It's me, Barun Dugirala on Take a Pause.